Hi, and welcome to the latest Value the Market shareholder webinar. We're delighted to welcome back Paul Bay, CEO of Touchstone Exploration, who's going to give us a presentation about all the recent successes his company has had and what his plans are for the future. Paul, welcome back. Thanks again, Ben. And yeah, it's it's great to be here. And we uh, we like this format to be able to to get out and, and have a little bit of discussion and some direct interaction with uh, with shareholders. So we really appreciate that. Um, I should note this is the first time since we did the uh, since we did the uh, recent equity issue that we've had a chance to sort of answer some questions. So hopefully we'll uh, we can deal with those a uh, bunch of the questions head on and and talk to people. But before that, what I want to do is just give you a a quick update of where we're at. Um, probably take five to 10 minutes here. And then following that, we can just jump into the questions, Ben. So let me start out, first of all, um, you know, our, our motto, although it's changed a little bit, um, driving growth, profitability and responsibility in the Trinidad oil and gas industry. I think there's a little bit more focus on, on some of the community involvement, some of the ESG involvements. It's something that's been at the top of our, our agenda and we continue to do that in, in what we've done. So we, we do that. Just a little bit of a forward-looking statement. You know, I'm going to be using some some forecasts, and there's a lot of things that can change along the way, as we've seen in the in the world the last couple of days. So, uh, just caution everybody on on that side. So, let me start with the the map. And for people that are are familiar with the story, basically we operate in the southern part of Trinidad. We've got two operating areas. Uh, one is down in the southwest part, which is really our our legacy assets. You know, million dollar wells come on it between 50 and 150 barrels a day, great rate of return. Right now we're sitting on about 200 drilling locations. Um, we haven't focused anything out there uh, in the past year, just mainly because we've been focusing on, on the other project. This is still a very exciting part of the program for us. I should mention there's also deeper opportunities um, on some of these historical assets. And as we get more comfortable on the exploration side, I think you'll see us uh, try to expand on uh, onto the exploration side in the, in the deeper place as well on the west side, but I'm not gonna to touch much on that today, but I just don't want people to forget that because it's, uh, you know, it's a it's a core part. It's creating positive cash flow. So, you know, um, right now we're covering expenses. We got positive cash flow, we're covering everything. The money that we're raising, that we raised in this last raise is all gonna go into the ground uh, over the next uh, six to nine months. So um, none of it's covering GNA or anything like that. So I just wanna make that. The big, the big point, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is Oratoire, which is that big license that you see on the east side of the island, and that's really what we're going to focus on. So I'm going to zoom in on that right now. So uh, this particular slide, that's a little updated from what some of the people might have seen before. And really what it is, is it the key things on this slide, there's really three key things. One is that central block that you see down in the, the southwest corner. Um, that's the big pool that's currently operated by Shell. It's going to recover almost a half a TCF of gas, 500 BCF and about 25 million barrels of liquids. The challenge that uh, James Shipcar, COO, and, and I put out to the team was let's see if we can find one or a couple more of those. And um, in order to do that, we identified four locations, Coho just north of that field, uh, Cascadura, Chinook, and Royston. And I'll talk about where we're at in that program. Um, the third thing that's key on this map is the green line that, that runs from sort of the northeast to the southwest. That's an oil pipeline um, that is a main sales line, and the little triangle on it is a, a riser where we could tie into. And then the red line that goes through the middle of the block and through the middle of the map, that's the main national gas company pipeline. Um, and it's uh, you can see little triangles on it also gives us tie-in opportunities there. The reason these are key is these are possible uh, tie-in alternatives for us as we go forward. So I'll just talk quickly about each one of these prospects. So the first one is Coho. Um, this was the first well we drilled, and I know I kept talking about it as being the, the smallest prospect, and it, it is small, but it's still very significant. I mean, it's virtually going to double production when it comes on mid-year this year, and um, that's on schedule. Uh, nothing's changed in our plan for that. That well will come on at about 10 to 12 million cubic feet a day and it'll, and it'll generate about, call it four to five million of cash flow annualized um, once we get that up and running. It's a great, particularly a, a, a great, great well. Um, the other thing I should just mention quickly is that on natural gas in Trinidad, all we pay is a 12 and a half percent crown royalty. There's no uh, additional sort of I'll call it royalties or, or the one tax that's called the supplemental petroleum tax or the SPT. 
So the economics on gas are really, really great. Second well we drilled was the Cascadura well, and it's probably the one that sort of stirred the market the most. Um, originally, we thought this was going to be an oil target, and the reason we thought that is the well that we were using is the key well offsetting it had, test, had produced uh, about 27,000 barrels over a number of years back in the late 1950s, 1960s. Um, we drilled the well based on 3D seismic. We were able to move up structure on the, on the structure, which is what we were planning on doing. And as we moved up structure, we gained a much thicker uh, sand package. Ended up with almost about 800 feet of sand in the bottom of the well bore. And we had to terminate the well early. Uh, we thought we drilled 8,200 feet. We terminated it at 63, 6,400 feet. Um, then what we've done is we've gone in and we've now tested the bottom 160 feet of that particular well. One thing that I'm not sure we've portrayed correctly, Ben, as we've gone through here is we're now going to move up hole and, uh, and perforate um, up above that about another 350 feet. I think people uh, originally thought that this was two different sands. It's actually one sand that we're going to test in two different in two different tests. So I think you know we feel pretty confident that that second test is going to be positive. The difference between this well and, and Coho is number one, it's about twice as big on the gas side, um, but it also has significant liquids with it. It, it. You know we produced about 700 barrels a day of liquids, um, and we didn't draw this down. So if this was the only thing that we had. Uh, let's say the second test didn't work, which again, I, I don't think that's a, a very significant possibility. We think you'd be able to bring on this well probably around 25, 26 million cubic feet a day, around that 5,000 BOE a day mark. So that's kind of the minimum of, of where we're at. So we're pretty excited about, um, obviously, about that. But more than that, it proved the concept that the team had come up with, which is there is a turbidite. There's a main fairway through the middle of here. It's obviously hydrocarbon charged. And it looks like there are more of those shell type Carapel Ridge pools to be found uh, in Trinidad on shore. So a bunch of things that are pretty exciting. It also made for some great pictures at night. So it was, uh, it was great to see. Um, the next well that we're gonna move on to is Chinook. And if I had shown you this presentation about six months ago, Chinook and Cascadura look very similar and they still do look very similar. I think the difference for us now is that, um, you know, we thought, this well might end up being an oil well. With what we've now seen at Cascadura, I think you probably see the same thing here. This is probably a liquids rich gas well. Uh, talking to the team, the drilling team this morning, we're hoping to move in there by middle of April, um, beginning of May, depending on how long things take. And we want to drill this well. Our target right now is to drill the well to about 9,200 feet if we can. Um, and that will again depend on, on what we encounter on the way down. So we'll move in there. And the final, um, one we want to look at is Royston, which I, I had always been talking about being the, the biggest of all of the uh, uh, of the sort of structures and opportunity here. It's quite a bit further to the east. It's about 10,500 feet, so it's a little bit deeper. Um, the nice thing with having raised this money in the last little while is we're probably going to be able to use two different rakes. So we'll be able to accelerate this program subject to, to when everybody's ready to go and when roads are built. But this really is, uh, you know, it's big and and. There's another structure to the south of this that's even a little bit, uh, uh, you know, it's a little more exploration, but it, it looks big as well. So there's there's lots of follow up as we go go forward on this. So I'll just kind of leave it there. But um, really, what we see is we see significant exploration opportunities uh, on the block, and and quite frankly, we also see those on our lands on the western side as we start to look below the uh, traditional lines. Um, you know, we've got a, a bunch of development now at Cascadura, Coho, and uh, and on the Western Block, as I mentioned, we've got 200 uh, drilling development drilling locations. Uh, we can talk about where we're funded now, but you know, as I mentioned, we're positive cash flow, and we've obviously got lots of cash in the bank now to, to finish the program. Um, I think when you look at what we've done, and Ben, you alluded to it, I think it's been pretty successful since we did the IPO. We tried to do what we said we were going to do. Sometimes it maybe takes a little longer than we'd like in Trinidad, but... Um, but anyway, I think we've been able to do that. And on the uh, social environmental responsibility side, I think we've done some great things with water reinjection, some recycling that we've done, drilling multiple wets, wells from a single pad, and then getting involved in the education system down there too has been been really great for us. So why don't I leave it at that, Ben, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you for, for questions. Brilliant, thank you, Paul. We've received a lot of questions in advance and over the course of this presentation. Just to remind viewers, if you want to ask any questions, there are there is a text on the right of the window. So present to them there and they will be passed through to our moderator.
Okay, Paul. Right, let's just start by talking about Castagadura. I think it's fair to say the company has knocked that one out of the park. You originally anticipated this would be a conventional oil play, but it's turned out to be what looks like a monumental gas discovery. Can you please help us quantify what you've discovered so far and what we might expect from the forthcoming results at Cascadura? Sure. Um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're basically perforating. We have perforated 160 feet of the lower sand. We're now going to move up and perforate 350 feet of the upper sand. Um, just to give you an idea of where we're at today, it's carnival today, so nothing happens yesterday and today. Um, probably more for safety reasons than practicality reasons. But, but uh, starting tomorrow, what we'll end up doing is pulling the pressure recorders from that lower zone, um, and then we'll isolate the lower zone, we'll go up, we'll perforate the upper zone. And, uh, you know, our, our, our thinking right now is that we should see a test very similar to what we what we saw in the lower. Uh, one of the constricting factors here is going to be the, the surface equipment is pretty well limited to 30 million cubic feet a day. So, you know, I wouldn't expect anything higher than that. But mechanically, what we can see when we test that is what the drawdown rate is, and then we can figure out a calculation as to what we'd be able to produce it at. And you want to produce it somewhere between 25 and 50% drawdown. And in the lower zone, we never even got to 25% drawdown. So it kind of gives you an idea of the capability of, of this particular uh, particular horizon. So so we'll go up, we'll perforate that, and then uh, and then we'll just figure out um, you know where the best uh, sales point is, where the best tie-in point is, what we need it at the well site to knock the liquids out and uh, fast track that as best as we can to get that on stream. So quantifiably, you know, what, what we've been telling people, Ben, is I, I think people should probably expect this to be probably a 40, 50 million a day uh, gas well at about 1,500 barrels a day, 1,000 to 1,500 barrels a day. Liquid. So if we consider current production rates, Cascadura alone could potentially double Touchstone's overall oil production across its portfolio of assets. Yeah, so if you take a look at it, if you sort of stack the wedges, you know, let's say today we're 1,700 barrels a day of oil production, you add on you know, 1,500 barrels a day from, uh, from Coho mid-year, you're about 32, you know, bring this on early next year, you're probably somewhere 8,000, 8,200, 8,500 um, uh, on the low end of, of what we do once we got Cascadura on. And that's assuming there's nothing more at Chinook or Royston, right? So, you know, I think that's kind of where you get to, uh, you know, Q1, Q2 of next year. We'll come on to Chinook and Royston and plans for the future in a bit. But just looking at this map that you've pulled up, we can see that there are two potential tying points to the north of the Cascadura well, and to the south of Coho, you have the shell-operated central block. I think it's three miles from Coho to the pipeline tying point. Is that correct? Yeah, so the, the tie-in down to the, uh, to the system to the south is about three kilometers, and we've already surveyed three that. Three, yeah, three kilometers. I think 3.2 is the exact number. Um, Anyway, we, we've already surveyed that, and, and we're getting bids in right now, and we're, we're moving forward with that as, as the plan to, to tie that in. So that's just kind of chugging along here as we go. And then if you, if you look at Cascadura, so it's you know, just north of Cascadura, they're about the same distance again, Ben. They're about uh, 3, 3.2 kilometers uh, from Cascadura to those tie-in points. So one question submitted so in what, advance so is what your expectations are now in terms of the capex requirement to bring both of these wells into production and to tie them into the two gas lines? Well, we've consistently said that Coho is going to, we think is going to be around 750,000 US um, to come down into the system. So I think that that's, you know, that's probably a good number that hasn't really changed. Cascadura, you know, originally we were, we were thinking this was going to be an oil well, right? So you would have just had a facility there and, and pump the oil. Um, now what we're thinking, especially being liquids rich gas, uh, I mean, the liquids are pretty valuable. So what we'd look at probably doing would be putting some sort of a little, uh, knockout facility at the at the uh, the well there and then tying it in but you know this is really where the the and the answer to your question on that is you know you're, you're probably looking at I don't know something that's 10 or 15 million dollars but that's you know fully fundable with debt and you know that's just bank line stuff that's that's certainly not equity but but there's a bigger question here Ben and it, it's really why we wanted to do this equity is we want to get Chinook and Royston drilled because we want to we want to be able to size these facilities properly. You know, I, I, I don't think we want to kind of piecemeal it. You know, the question here is, is do you need a 40, 50 million a day facility? Do you need a hundred million a day facility? Do you need 150 million a day facility? We, we really need to get these other two wells drilled because the, the logical tie in point may be where the pipeline and the, or the gas line and the oil line um, cross each other. 
And what you do is put a big facility there, bring all the uh, bring all the gas into that, and then uh, and then you know put the oil into the liquids line, put the gas into the gas line. Um, on top of that, um, we we've had a discussion with the National Gas Company of Trinidad, and and they're ultimately the ones you'd have to sell your gas to on the island. That's just the way the it's set up, and they're actually great at it. So it's it's actually a benefit, but. They've also implied to us that they are very interested in building facilities and pipelines. Um, and we're working through that with them right now to understand that a little bit better. But, you know, there is a possibility here that they would end up building all that infrastructure for us, rolling it into their rate base, and it would just be a, a simple deduction off our gas price. So it's pretty early to tell. Um, you know, I want to remind everybody of two things. We expected Cascadeur to be an oil well. So, you know, that's only three weeks old. And second, you know, we were also thinking any gas might be able to come down to that facility at Central Block, but we now know that there's not nearly enough capacity down there for, for what we're dealing with. So these are all good problems, but um, pretty early on for us to give you definitive answers on it all. So where, where on the island do you think might have the um, capacity to, to take all the extra gas that you're expecting to produce now? Well, that's, you know, that's one of the big advantages of Trinidad. Right now, uh, depending on on who you want to talk to, it's between, production's between 3.66 BCF a day and 3.8 BCF a day, and demand is 4.2 BCF a day. Um, so right now they are curtailing and shutting in facilities uh, because they don't have enough gas. So that main line that you see that runs through the middle of our property actually goes up to the Point Lisa's industrial site where they need the gas. So, you know, whether it's uh, Nutrien, Methanex, uh, you know, Yara, the fertilizer or, or whoever, um, you know, this gas is, it has a huge demand for sure. So that, that part of it's kind of unique in that, in the, you know, not many places around the world where you really have a, a shortage of gas. And because it's an island, they can't really bring any in. So it works perfectly. Great, Paul. So it's clear you've got very strong local demand for your gas. And obviously the company will be up, able to update its new reserves in the, in the near future. Do you have any idea over the timeline for delivering an updated reserves report? So uh, we do an annual reserve report, which is just getting done right now. Um, the only thing that will be in the reserve report this year will be coho. Um, and the reason for that is the uh, independent evaluators want to see test results before you book it. And the Cascadura test didn't happen until 2020. So it'll actually come into this year's report. Um, and on the coho one, I want to be a, a little bit careful on that because we're just working through that. But but, um, you know, we had alluded before that we thought it was something, you know, at minimum size was going to be about 15 BCF. And that looks like that's uh, in agreement with what we're seeing. And the, and the real question is, do you need a second well to drain the pool as we now look at the pool and, and that kind of thing? As far as Cascadura goes, uh, let us pull the pressure recorders here. Uh, as I mentioned, that's going to happen in the next day or two. Uh, let us perforate that upper sand, see what we get rates for that, and then we'll have a much better idea. But, but you know, I, th I think when you look at the original well at, at – at central block um you know that well i think aof 100 million 110 million a day and 3,000 barrels a day of liquids um i think when you add our two uh our two tests together you know you could easily see this being a 60 million a day 70 million a day aof and and uh a couple thousand barrels a day of liquids so you know and then if you kind of look at the reserves they were able to book at central block um you know, I think we can start to draw some parallels. The, you know, the nice thing here is it's not like we found something new. Uh, when I say new, it, it's not unique to the island. We've already, you know, we've already seen other fields on the island that have produced hundreds of BCF. So it's not inconceivable, you know, to see a couple of hundred BCF pools uh, located on our on our Oratoa blocks. So, um, and you know, it's been that central block has been producing now for seventeen or eighteen years. So you can kind of see the longevity of of you know, if we're right here, um, what we're looking at. Great. And in that context, and looking to the future, let's talk a little bit about Chinook and Royston. You've gone on the record saying you're looking to drill these as quickly as possible. Can you confirm, is Touchstone fully funded for both these wells? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I should talk about that here because I think it's probably the, the big question is why did we, you know, why did we do the fundraising in the size we did? We were actually going to go for a smaller fundraise, um, you know, and just fund, fundraise Chinook. And at the end of the day, there was, I think, pretty strong market response. As everybody could see, we actually were able to move the price up from 38p to 40p, which I know at the time looked like a big discount, but it it was a really strong book. 
And we just needed to take some of the uncertainty out of, uh, you know, with all the, all the things that are going on around the world. Um, we actually, at the end of the day, I think we ended up with 12 or 13 uh, million uh, pounds in, in orders. Um, we only took nine, which meant a bunch of people got cut back. Um, but the, you know, the real re reason there is we just, we just need certainty to get these two wells drilled and, and, you know, working through it with Scott, that gave us the money to be able to crank things up. If we need to use two rigs, we can use two rigs. You know, we're in the field right now putting in bridges and roads and getting everything happening. So yeah, it, it, um, certainty and acceleration. Those are the two words that I like to use around the, the fundraising and, and everybody knows we have to drill that fourth car by the end of October. Um, cause that's the terms of the license. And we just, you know, we can't mess around here. We've got a, a world-class asset that we don't want to, we don't want to have any, any issues with. So that's, uh, that's what we did. Excellent. What is the timeline now for drilling these two wells? When do you expect to make the first announcements about commissioning operations? So right now, uh, as I mentioned this morning, we were just sort of lining up equipment. Um, I, I would think Chinook's going to, they'll probably move in the middle of April, probably a couple of weeks to move in, drill that May and June. Um, we'll have results on that hopefully the end of June. And depending on how that rig does, um, we'll be able to use that rig to slide right over to Royston. And if not, what we may have to do is use a bigger rig that's currently on the island and it's going to drill one well for somebody else first. Um, we would then bring it down and uh, we would then bring it down and drill uh, drill Royston with it. That probably wouldn't be till August, September. So um, you might see that spaced out. But we're also talking about there is the possibility of if, you know, if Chinook were to work, um, the other alternative is for us to drive the, as the rigs going back up past Cascadura, basically the road goes right past Cascadura. We access from the north. We could slide into Cascadura and drill a second well at Cascadura and get to that 8,200 feet, which is what we were planning on doing. And, and you know, we weren't able to do it. And I, I think we've identified two reasons we weren't able to do it. One is we need to uh, restructure the casing uh, structure um, so that we're actually using more strings of casing to keep uh, keep everything behind. And we're also going to go to an oil-based mud system, which will uh, allow us to stabilize all the clays and everything. So, you know, that's the other alternative here, as you could see, potentially by the end of the year, you could see a second well drill at Cascadera, uh, the well drilled at Royston um, before the end of the year. So that's that's in the planning right now. As we move into 2021, you've mentioned the need for a second well at Coho to drain the gas pool there as part of your development program. Could you tell us a bit more about your plans here? The early test results, remember, we've really only got 36 hours of test results here, um, indicate something that would justify a second well. But at this point, what we'd, what we'd really like to do is get it on stream, produce it probably for a year, uh, run the pressure recorders again, and then it'll give us a good size of the pool. So I just think from a cost of capital basis, um, it makes more sense for us to wait on that in, in what we're doing. Right, Paul. So we've had some questions asking about the government's response in Trinidad has been to your recent discoveries. Can you tell us how Touchstone is currently viewed in the country? Yeah, I, you know, obviously the response is, uh, has been really exciting. You know, I was down at the energy conference, which is right at the beginning of February, um, when we were actually doing the test results. And it was kind of, it was almost a little bit embarrassing in that, in that the, uh, the energy minister, I think talked about us three times in his speech. Um, he also has a, a great line about, you know, new people looking at new things. And uh, so that was good, um, you know, in what in what we saw. I think it's obviously an election year this year in Trinidad. So everybody's trying to take credit for the great success we've had, whether it's this government or the, the previous government, which issued us the license. So it's uh, it's been kind of fun on on that regard. So I think, you know, we're seeing good good coverage on that. I think the other thing that's really important is this particular part of the island hasn't had a lot of um, exploration or production success in probably the last 30 years. So there is a real local economic impact um, that we can have in the area in a, in a very positive way. Uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the work we do out in this particular area can be done with local contractors, and we've been working very very closely with the local MP um, to make sure that we're we're putting as many local people. Uh, to work as we can out here. And, that, and that's pretty exciting all the way from, you know, little things like the restaurants and the non-existent hotels where we're looking for uh, Airbnbs for, for people to stay in and, and uh, you know, 
with the Uber drivers now know where Cascadura is because a bunch of the test guys were using them to drive it back and forth. So just little things like that that I think are, are going to be a real benefit out here. You briefly mentioned in the presentation your plans for further development of Touchstone's assets in the west of Trinidad. What are you planning over there in the future? Sure. The, the Western lands, we, we haven't focused on them really for two reasons. One is we wanted to s- spend the capital on the Oratoire block, and I think that was obviously the, the right decision. Um, but out West, the, uh, as some people may know, that the Crown Corporation that is our partner out on the West, it used to be called Petrotrin, and then it got split up about a year ago into various different uh, entities. And the entity who's now our partner is a company called Heritage. And one of the first things Heritage wanted to do was put together um, uh, better joint venture relationships between its existing partners. And so they asked us to put together a proposal of sort of our wish list of what a new agreement would look like uh, on those lands on the Western part. And so over the last year, we've been working with them back and forth to talk about some of the things that would improve the economics for us and also increase production for them, which is really their driver. And it's taken a little while. Unfortunately, um, their CEO got got quite sick and and um, and has left the had to leave the country. So the so the CEO got replaced, and so we had to go through the process a second time. But in fairness to them, um, I think they really understand uh, what they need to do to attract new capital um, to to those older, more mature pools. So. You know, we've sort of been sitting on the sideline trying to get these new agreements in place before we start to spend money out there. Right now, their target is to have them in place by the end of March. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Trinidad sometimes can be a little bureaucratic, so we'll we'll stay optimistic on that. But but I think in April, um, March, April, something like that, you you might see something off us. It, it's exciting. It's great economics. It's very low risk. Um, you know, it, it's something that we can continue to do. And as I mentioned, we've got two hundred and eight locations out there so you know we we would see ourselves doing a development drilling program up there in a perfect world once we get the cash flow coming out of uh, Oratoi you'd see a portion of that cash flow uh, go to the development drilling program but but quite frankly if you know the kind of numbers we're talking out at Oratoi you've got you've got cash that's beyond your capital needs uh, coming out of the program. It sounds extremely encouraging that you expect Touchstone will be generating such significant cash flow hopefully in the not too distant future. What do you plan to do with that money? Well, well, right now, you know, and we've talked about this since we went went public. Is um, you know, it is an island, so there's only so much money you can spend. I mean, it, it it does kind of limit it. We we're not looking anywhere else at this point. You know, we've always said we wanted to be the largest onshore producer in Trinidad, and I think a lot of people uh, kind of maybe um, uh, laughed at us a little bit about that. I think we're going to prove them wrong as we go forward here, and that's that's exciting, but. But what we can then do is, um, you know, we could look at a dividend model as we go forward here for sure. You know, we set this up from a, from a structure point of view where we can very effectively uh, take after-tax money and dividend it out to, to shareholders. And, we, you know, we've seen good success with that on the exchange. You know, there's two or three different companies that are um, are definitely uh, divcos that, 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 that look interesting. So I think that's an option to look at. But I, I don't want to get locked in here because there's a – there is a bunch of capital yet that we need to drill. And, and you know, we've got these four stars on the map that we talk about. Uh, James and the team actually have 11 different structures out here. So, so we're only testing four of these structures with the initial program. You know, there's seven other um, structures that can be tested out here that we still need to do. So kind of gives you the, the magnitude, you know, of, of, of what the potential is on this particular block. And, and more importantly, really what the potential is in Trinidad. It, it's, um, you know, it's it's a hydrocarbon rich um, area and you, you start to look at it a different way. I think I think you're going to see a resurgence of activity in the country onshore. That all sounds very encouraging. But those other seven structures you mentioned, have any of them previously been drilled? Do you have any historical data on them to guide future drilling or are these fresh targets? Um a couple of them have been drilled, but not down to the depth that we, let's say that we've taken uh, Cascadeur or Coho. So you kind of get a good idea of structure, but but in essence, they would fall more into the exploration side. You know, I'll call it round two of, of the exploration side. But I should also note that currently on those four targets that we have, Coho, Cascadeur, Chinook, and Royston, we have 14 wells licensed because we've got multiple wells from each pad. 
So if they're successful, like Cascadura, um, you can actually drill a second well or a third well on those pads. So there's both a development program and an exploration program on this block. And that's why I don't want to get kind of tied into a dividend model because there is, you know, if, if, if Chinook or Royston work um, and we really have unlocked the, a little bit of the code out here, there, there is a lot more to do for the next number of years. We have a question from Jason in that context. He says you previously expected the company to be producing 10,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day in two years' time. So I'll ask you the same question now. Where do you see Touchstone in two years in terms of production? You know, I think with what we see now, you can you can see yourself pretty clearly through to 10,000 BOEs a day sometime in 2021. Um, and really, it's, you, you know, that next step change is going to be um, is if you have if you have luck at Chinook and, and Royston. Um, and, and of that, you know, of that 10,000 BOEs a day, I, I think a big chunk of that comes from our development side, too. Like there's a real chance that you could get 3000 barrels a day on the on the development side on the Western properties, especially if we put in place these new agreements with Heritage, I think um, those lands become much more attractive. So, uh, but you can kind of see their incremental change. And I, I know it's probably not the answer you really want, Ben, but but you can kind of see that each one of these structures, you know, just materially adds to that, that level. But I think with what I know today, uh, 10,000 BOEs a day in 2021 looks very doable. That brings us nicely into a question Wayne has asked us. Are there any other oil companies looking over your shoulder at the moment that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, obviously there is. I mean, it, um, you know, there's the other players on the island, uh, you know, whether it's EOG or Shell or um, BP or BHP. I mean, they're all, they're all, you know, pretty familiar. And uh, quite frankly, they can all read the newspaper. And, you know, we every couple of weeks, there's another article on Touchstone in the newspaper. So I think that that's... Uh, that's there. And, you know, I think probably the underlying question is, is would you ever look at selling this to somebody down the road? And I, I don't think that's really where we're at. Um, you know, you want to drill it up and see, see where we're at. You know, we talked about these other seven structures that we want to evaluate. Um, you know, it's just too early on at that. But at these kind of volumes, you know, when you start talking about 100 million cubic feet a day, um, you know, that moves the needle for a lot of people on the island. So I, I think it is. The other, you know, the other side that people are companies that are interested are also the end users, right? Whether that be Atlantic LNG, uh, Nutrien, uh, Methanex, you know, because they want to secure their their gas supply as well. So I think there's lots of interest in it, um, but you know, we're not going down that path right now. The the path for us is clearly to to drill the wells, evaluate what we've got, and then figure out what we can do from there. Okay, moving on to another topic. We've had another question from a shareholder in advance. What is the latest with respect to the VAT refund? You know, I, I have to admit that that's uh, there hasn't we haven't had any VAT refunds. That's probably the long and short of it. Um, you know, the government still is struggling through, uh, you know, some lower oil prices and some other things that they're dealing with. So they've they've kind of used the VAT as a little bit of their piggy bank. And, you know, that's part of the other reason for doing the equity issue is you can't you know, we can't rely on the VAT uh, to come in to pay the bills. So. Um, I'm uh, I'm disappointed to say that uh, the answer to that is no. There's been nothing. Come in. I think we may have lost Ben. Um, I've got a few of the questions up on the screen here. I don't know. While we try to WhatsApp them here, I'll maybe try to ask. There's there's one of the questions is do you plan to drill a deeper uh, original target at Cascadura? Uh, short answer to that is yes. Um, you know, we still want to go down to 8,200 feet. Um, that was the primary target down there. And as I mentioned, there's multiple wells available on every location. So um, that's one of the things that we, we want to do. And hopefully we can do that with the new the new drilling of the, the multiple casing strings, as well as the uh, the oil based um, the oil based uh, mud system. So I think that that's, you know, something that we we definitely are looking at. Um, uh, in that same zone, I see somebody else has asked me how big was the target at uh, at Cascadura it, 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 at eight thousand feet. Um, quite frankly, it's sort of you know we were looking for another four to five hundred feet of sand. Uh, key thing with Cascadura, even at sixty three hundred feet, we weren't through the sand. We just had to stop because we couldn't drill any further. So it was um, you know a bit of a challenge on on that regard. So we got to rethink that. But but it's 
I, I think everybody's got to kind of think of this whole region and, and realize that, you know, we drilled two wells into it. There's lots of things that can still go wrong, but I think what's more important is it's, it's proving up that this really is a hydrocarbon uh, charge region with lots of, uh, lots of capabilities for sure. Uh, the next question is when can we expect the uh, next test results at Cascadura? So the plan right now is to pull the recorders this week, um, isolate the lower zone and move up whole. So I would suggest that if everything mechanically goes as planned, um, you know, we're looking for something that should be, should be, have some really good results by the middle of March. Um, I think that that probably kind of works in with what we're looking at. So, so that's where we are. Uh, the next question was approximately what net back per BOE per day or per MCF do you expect to receive on the gas from Coho and Cascadura? So right now, um, although we don't have any agreements with NGC, we, we think the gas price is somewhere between 315 and 380 uh, at MCF. Um, we think it's somewhere in that range. And um, so, you know, by the time you take off uh, costs and royalties and everything else, we, we think there should be a dollar eighty to two dollar net back on that. So you can see that it generates, and that's really where we get around to the four or five million uh, USD. The other thing I should mention is these are all USD dollars we get paid in USDs. So it's um, I know Scott's excited about that. It's always good to have USDs in in the uh, portfolio. Ben, did you crack back online there? Yeah. Oh, it looks like I'm back. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you better, better? now. Yeah, okay, sorry about this. Um, so just for everyone who's watching, I'm in a hotel at the moment. We did our sound test earlier and everything was fine, but obviously the Wi-Fi is being used a lot as we've been speaking. So I'm very sorry for, for, for these uh, technical issues. Can you can you hear me okay now, Paul? Yeah, I just I just went through the a bunch of the questions on the screen, Ben, so I just kind of kept going without you. Don't don't want you to feel bad about that. <laughs> no, exactly. Maybe I had the viewers a feeling. So Paul, look, now you can hear me a bit. Um, I'd really like to ask you a bit about the fundraise um, and the process that you went through. Now, obviously, I was on the inside. I, I couldn't comment on it on the time, but having sort of, you know, watched what happened with this, there's sort of quite an interesting story to tell. So could you just tell us a bit about the process that you went through and, and sort of how, how we ended up at the price that we did? Yeah, uh, and I, I, I can't give you all the insight, obviously, on it, but but I can give you the sort of some of the generalities. You know, the idea is we, we knew roughly what we wanted to raise in order to fully fund the program. And um, we, uh, we, we did a pretty good canvas of uh, various institutions in, in London. And um, the advice that we got from our, our broker um, was to do what's called an accelerated book build. So once we had a really good indication that the book was, was sort of covered at a given price, we could then go out and see if there was inside uh, interest outside of that. And I think we were a little bit surprised, um, and rightly so, the, the institutions were interested, but they were interested at a, a fairly significant discount. And in fairness to them, I think that, you know, with what we've seen happen in the energy industry this, this year in the energy market, that doesn't really surprise me. I mean, there's a lot of uh, concern out there, especially with what's going on around the world with with the virus and, and where's demand going to be. I think that they were, you know, a little bit... Um, uh, cautious, so so they had given us a pretty good indication of a, of a book at a at a fairly low level, and you know in 30 years of doing this, at the same time the stock's kind of taken off like a rocket in the other direction, um, and so at some point we just had to make a decision. So what we did is, as you saw, we put out the RNS that said we were looking at doing uh, roughly seven million pounds at at 38p, um, and then we did what what is called the accelerated book build, which is basically after the market, you, you see if you can build the book beyond that. And what we actually found out with, was the book would have been over two times oversubscribed at the 38p. So what the advisors did is said, you know, maybe what we can do is we can move that price up to 40 and then let's see where the book ends up. And um, we actually ended up, I think, with about 12 million or 13 million pounds of orders. So it was again oversubscribed. Um, but we didn't really need more than the nine million, and and quite frankly, we don't want the dilution, and that's really the balance here is between dilution and 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 needing the cash. So so we did that, but by moving it up to forty, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, some of the institutions just said that that was not enough discount for them to play. So we actually unfortunately lost some of the institutions along the way, um, and picked up some other ones. I mean, it it sort of traded out because obviously the book filled up, but but um, yeah, that and that's the story. So I think. 
you know, everybody likes the story, but the energy, you know, the energy sector right now is pretty tough. So um, it, it may have looked like a very big discount. Certainly on the day that we did it, it looked big. But if you think that the book was really built four or five days prior to the announcement, um, it was pretty tightly priced to uh, to where that particular number was. So um, that's uh, that's where we are today. I think we might have lost Ben again. Is there an area of Cascadura on 3D similar to Carapel Ridge? We actually do have uh, 3D over Coho and Cascadura and Chinook, and that's really what we're using to um, to move up structure. We we don't really have the 3D over uh, over Carapel Ridge, but um, we do have some good indications of what that looks like. So we've been able to draw the analogies to that. And, and we are using 3D not only to pick our drilling locations, but obviously eventually to, to um, uh, ultimately to, to do the development work as well on it. Um, do you have equipment that can measure flow beyond 5,000 BOEs a day? Uh, the, the real limiting factors on the gas side and the flare stack and um, uh, right now that they're not comfortable going much over 30 million a day. So it'll depend on where the liquids volumes are. But again, I, I, I don't want people to get hung up on that. I, I'd rather them not to, because we can actually get the mechanical data based on the drawdown. Like, like it, it, it becomes very mathematical when you do the test, you, you know, you're getting pressure instantaneous. You're seeing what flow rates are, you're seeing what fluids are. And when, then when you run the, that through the economic model, you know, whatever the pressure is, um, from what the original pressure is, you can figure out what the drawdown is, you know what you want to produce the well at, and it, it becomes the drawdown that becomes the driving factor. So then, you know, uh, James, Alex, and the team can then go do the math and figure out what they want to produce it at. So um, I'm, I'm not concerned about that. I, I think that let's not, I, I'd rather people not get hung up on it. I think what's going to be more important, it'll be that second part of that R&S that we put out that says basically, um, you know, uh, here's what the here's what the test results were. Here's what the company thinks this will become on production at, uh, and we will have that in the next RNS, so it'll give you a better idea um, in what we're looking at there. Um, uh, do you think the placing price accurately reflects the intrinsic value of the company at this moment in time? Yeah, you know, I think when you look at where it's moved to with the test results that we have. Um, you know, I, I'm not uncomfortable um, that sort of somebody's asking the question, we leave a bunch of money on the table. I, I may feel totally different than that after we do the next second test at Cascadura. Um, certainly if Chinook and Royston uh, come in, uh, there's no question about that. But in order to unlock that intrinsic value, we needed the cash uh, to drill the next wells. Um, we have no way of determining that without the cash. Like we just, we don't have enough cash flow um, to drill these next two wells with debt was just not an alternative. So, you know, it's, it's a trade off of you, you got to leave a little bit on the table for the investor. Um, but, you know, I think the stocks north of I was about 140 million of, of market cap, Canadian market cap when we pulled the trigger on that equity. So uh, I guess the short answer to that is, is uh, from what we knew at that given time, it seemed like a pretty fair price. Uh, last question, Paul. And sorry for the poor connection, um, but do you expect this might be the last placing? Um, it, 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 it very well could be. I mean, if, if, what, uh, if what the operations team is thinking now, and certainly if the National Gas Company does what they say they're going to do, which is fund the facilities, um, not that we would equity raise anyway, but, but their timeline is pretty tight. They think they can move very quickly to get this gas on production. Um, we start to get a wall of cash coming at us, you know, faster than we can build leases and, uh, and drill wells in here for sure. So if you get, if you get to that particular stage, um, you know, I think that it becomes very much a self-funding model. And, and again, the reason for doing the placing this time was we need the cash to drill these next two wells because the licenses, you know, we got to get in before the license. So once the license is earned, um, you can start to move timing around a little bit more. Um, when you want to do the development drilling and appraisal wells and all those other things. So, so time becomes our friend versus our enemy, which is the situation where we were in when we, when we made this particular decision. 
Um, how many more wells can be drilled into the Cascadura discovery? Don't know that yet. That's what the pressure information will definitely tell us uh, in what we see. But uh, for sure, there's two more locations to drill there. I can say that for sure because we want to take one deeper for sure. And then the other one is we, we actually saw some really interesting sands up hole. If you look at that press release in the lower crews and the other, there's probably a secondary um, shallower play in here. And that lower cruise, I remind everybody, is the same zone that we chase on the west side of the island um, in what we're looking at over there. So there's definitely additional drilling at Cascadura. It's probably, you know, it's by far the most exciting well I've ever drilled in, in 30 years when you think about it. Like we, you know, we had hydrocarbon all the way down there. We've got good pressure. We've got a good test and touch wood. It, uh, you know, if we get a good test off on the second one, it's, um, it's going to be a beast for sure. Um, I'm going to keep going here for another minute, Ben. We're only at 49 minutes, but uh, will you consider uh, hedging any oil and gas production in light of price volatility? Um, yes, we have. If you look at our history, we've actually hedged um, we've actually hedged about a third of our production at various given times. Um, we are we don't have any hedges in place right now, and certainly um, if prices were to move up, we would do that. But right now. Um, no, we don't. You know, the best hedge in, in our business, quite frankly, is to have a really good balance sheet and low operating costs, you know, so that you can make money all the way down to, you know, call it 40, 45 dollars a barrel, which we, we obviously can now. Um, you know, that that's probably still the best hedge, especially in an environment where oil has a high royalty on it. Um, you really that's really the, the name of the game. So that's our, our focus. But yes, historically, we've done it. Yes, we'd love to do it again as we go forward. And quite frankly, when we get these larger volumes, we might be able to do that. One of the questions we, we have that uh, not a lot of people have asked us is, how does light oil and condensate, how does it get priced on the island? Um, the answer is we don't know. There is some offshore condensate that, uh, that BP buys, um, which we could, we could get into that market. But with the petrochemical business on the island, it, it's actually a pretty valuable commodity. So we may... We may see some great pricing for the uh, the condensate. Um, would you look at buying other blocks in TT further down the road, like the St. Mary's block? That's somebody that's obviously very uh, very knowledgeable of of the land position here. So the St. Mary's block is around the south end of our Oratois block, and then it wraps around the front of of uh, Central Range block and in front of Coho and. Uh, the short answer is there's some interesting prospects there. Obviously, our plate is more than full where we are today. Um, the St. Mary's Blocks has some very large financial commitments on it that we just we just could not take on right now. There, I think they're 30 or 35 million. So it's not something that we're looking right now. If the block somehow gets split up or or uh, or moved around, I think that might be of interest. Should mention that just to the north of us is the Rio Claro Block, and um, it's owned by a private company and and so there's not great access to information but it looks like they may have a couple of discoveries on that block as well which you know again talks to my whole concept of this being a much bigger play and and good for the entire country so yeah i think that's great um final question um have any other uh Oil companies on the island reached out to farm out proposals on the Oratois? Uh, no, there haven't been actually. Um, you know, we've had, uh, I guess we've had a couple of people that are on the um, consumer side that have said, you know, if we wanted to partner on building some of the infrastructure and doing some other things, but but no, we haven't had anybody come up to us with a, a farm in proposal at this point. And I think quite frankly, with what we've got financed now and with the first two discoveries, um, any farm out right now would be really detrimental to potential shareholder value from what we see. So we got the ability, you know, these aren't super expensive wells um, and the upside is just too big. I, I'm not sure we want to give 50% of it away to somebody right now. So let's, let's drill the next couple of wells and see where we're at. So I think on that note, um, Ben, I, I, I'm going to leave it. I hope that answers a bunch of questions. Um, we've obviously got a, a website that also has a, a general information uh, account to it. So please don't hesitate to send anything through to that. And we'll try to keep you best as formed as we can. And Ben, this is a, a great format for us, uh, great interaction and really appreciate everybody for, for tying in today. And um, yeah, it's gonna be exciting. We got 
results out in the next three weeks on the test. A couple months after that, we should have Chinook results, and then hopefully test results a couple months after that, and then we'll move into Royston. So between now and the end of October, it's going to be uh, going to be a lot of stuff going on at, at TXP. Thanks, everybody.